All right, so moving on uh, to the next chapter in Hypermodernity and the End of the World. Uh, let's see where we're at here. Should be Dialogue 3. Yeah, uh, Donald Trump and the Truman Show. Um, so I kick this one off. Um, Ebert. Let me start today by synopsizing the blog piece that I wrote about Donald Trump on January 29th, 2016. When I heard that he was going to run for president, I knew right away that he was going to win because I remembered where Oswald Spengler in The Decline of the West said we were at in terms of his comparative civilizational timelines. We are, according to him, right now where the Romans were in approaching the year zero, about the time of the civil wars and the disintegration of the Republic and its transformation into an empire. The types of guys that Spengler identified as the men who came in and took control of everything remind me of Trump quite a bit, especially that first triumvirate. The first triumvirate that came into power was composed of Pomp Pompey, Crassus, and Julius Caesar. And they had a kind of metastable three-body situation where the metastability actually created a kind of stability. As long as those three guys were there to check each other's power, everything was okay. So Julius Caesar goes off to Gaul, and he had all kinds of financial problems, but he solved them once he conquered Gaul and started sending slaves back and selling them on the market and made his fortune that way. Pompey made his fortune as a general a military man who cleaned up the problem of the pirates that were plaguing the Mediterranean. It was a big problem, like with today's Somalian pirates, and nobody could travel safely until Pompey cleaned everything up, and he was very good at this. He also entered Palestine during the period of the Troubles in Jerusalem, and he cleaned that up too. So this was a guy who got things done. But Crassus is the one who I think resembles Trump the most because he was a real estate mogul who made his fortune out of huge plantations called Latifundia these gigantic slave plantations that are very similar to modern corporations. And he also owned many buildings which were called insuli, these big high-rise apartment buildings that were notorious for collapsing during earthquakes and killing bunches of people. But that's the time of the great megalopolises. You have the high-rise apartment skyscraper full of poor people as a signature characteristic of any megalopolitan age, such as ours is again on the turn of the historical spiral. Crassus then gets the idea into his head that he wants to pull in Alexander the Great and go conquer the Middle East together with his son, going all the way to India, just like Alexander did. So they go to the Middle East to fight the Parthians, who were a group of Persian people who had mastered the compound bow and could ride and shoot from horseback with great precision. Crassus goes over there to fight the Parthians, and the Parthians make short work of him and his troops. They cut off his son's head and send it back to him, and then they cut off Crassus's head and send it back to the Romans, who were horrified by all this. Mark Antony later went into Palestine to conquer the Parthians and clean up the mess that Crassus failed to do. These three, guys, these three guys were what Spengler identified as the type of money men who come in to hijack the political machinery at the time a society is collapsing. In such a period, money calls all the shots. Money becomes the primary power, far more powerful than any system of checks and balances inherent to the state. And with the rise of such absurdly wealthy individuals, the real sinister development is that they can afford to pay for a private army. They can privatize the military. And of course, those soldiers are no longer loyal to Rome. They are loyal now to Caesar or Crassus or Pompey. That is where the loyalty goes. I think the alliance between Trump and Eric Prince of Blackwater is a potentially similar development. And so when I heard that Trump was going to run, I predicted in my blog piece one year earlier that he would win based on this comparison with the types of money men who hijacked the Roman political machinery at the time of the first triumvirate. Trump is a political anomaly. He fits neither exactly right nor exactly left. He makes his own rules, and he is frighteningly autonomous. Culkin. It is so interesting to try and register someone like Donald Trump into our contemporary political horizon, because in many ways he signifies the very opposite of neoliberalism and the identity politics that sustains hypermodernity. He is crude, often completely insensitive to matters of race and sexuality, and espouses a distinctly nationalist view of the world. That is to say, he claims to be an anti-globalist. But that is precisely it. In other words, he is the embodied backlash against the neoliberal identity politics, the multicultural capitalist globalization that has come to dominate the political scene since the 1980s. Trump and these other pseudo-nationalist politicians emerging around the world right now are all bearing witness to the structural failure of the neoliberal project. Le Pen, Viktor Orban, and perhaps the most dangerous of all of them, Bolsonaro in Brazil. But they are bearing witness to the fact that we are all approaching somewhat of a dead end here, or as Bifo Berardi says, the future has been canceled. So yes, in one sense, the political rise of Trump and his nationalism represents the backlash of neoliberal globalization. But yet in another sense, Trump also embodies so much of the neoliberal praxis as it is. 
His view of the world is entirely instrumental, purely economic. His entire measurement for judging the worthiness of anything is by polling numbers or ratings. This is a similar logic that Google or Amazon adheres to as well in their various analytic formulas. Valuation is expressed economically and computationally, not qualitatively. And then just the fact that his very personhood is expressed principally through either Twitter or reality television, so-called pro progressive and contemporary forms of mediation, speaks to his profound synchronicity with some of the core principles of the neoliberal order. What I'm trying to say is that Trump effectively rejects himself. His brand of nationalist populism is what appears to stand directly against New York City developers and reality television stars. I noticed that Trump recently made his Twitter banner a picture of all these old-time World War II veterans. There's great dignity in that picture, I must admit, and Trump fetishizes this kind of throwback Americana in multiple ways. But what could be more opposed to this kind of earthy American humility than The Apprentice? So Trump is representative of both the cancer of neoliberalism at its most elemental, but also what rises up to stop the cancer from spreading further. It's some kind of strange exteriorization that he is performing. In other words, Houston, we have a serious problem. I do think his presence is a signifier of some kind of endgame, though, regarding the project of America, because Donald Trump is not just a human being, he is also a brand. Isn't that what we are all becoming now, brands? Trump is a brand name that signifies golf courses, luxury hotels, casinos, and perhaps most importantly, reality television, an emblematic medium of hypermodernity. He, in a way, signifies this rather strange detachment of life with its material base. It's very interesting here comparing Trump with his father, Fred Trump, the man who lent him money to begin his empire. Let's not forget Fred Trump made real housing for real people. He built working class units throughout the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn for working class New York people. The union laborers, the firefighters, the nurses, these were the people Fred Trump built housing for. Now when Donald comes into the picture, what we have in 70s New York City is a fiscal crisis. We have a city that had been for the past decade essentially torn apart. And this is not just New York City, this is virtually every American city during the 60s, which was the principal decade of America's deindustrialization. Whereas before, urban American space was the very center of the American productive economy, factories, warehouses, docks, men working 9 to 5 shifts, etc. Those days are disappearing by the late 70s, and Donald Trump begins to envision the city as simply a place for millionaires. Luxury housing, skyscrapers, fancy restaurants, etc. Donald Trump is the great gentrifier of not just urban real estate, but culture too. Ebert. Let me ask a question here. Is this connected to what Robert Moses was doing at the time, redesigning New York in the 60s? essentially housemanizing it? Culkin. I don't think Robert Moses had any real insight regarding the potential future of urban America. He didn't read his Jane Jacobs, as we all know. He certainly didn't anticipate the crisis that was about to overtake these cities, and in a way, he contributed to that very same post-war urban crisis. Robert Moses in New York was a major figure of post-war urban development. Donald Trump comes in a little bit afterwards in the wake of Moses, when the New York City fiscal crisis hit in 1975 and the city budget was effectively handed over to bankers on Wall Street, what followed from this was effectively a free-for-all for real estate developers. And nobody in New York City benefited more from that privatization and deregulation than Donald Trump. Trump's rise as a New York City property developer followed directly from the economic and social chaos that resulted from the deindustrialization of New York City and the subsequent fiscal crisis of the 70s. What Trump really signifies is the archetypal gentrifier of urban American space. He was doing to Manhattan in the 80s what is now happening in the 21st century to Philadelphia, Boston, and Baltimore. He was doing this before anybody, making a whole city into nothing but overpriced condos and high-rises for yuppies to live in. He was absolutely essential in helping to re reframe the very idea of urban life into a purely techno-economic model, a free-for-all of jouissance, which is basically the core logic of gentrification. Trump had been flirting with politics since the early 90s. He had been vocally criti criticizing the general direction of America in every single presidential election since the early 90s. Interestingly enough, at the White House press dinner in 2014, where Obama famously publicly humiliated Trump because he had been giving Obama such a hard time about his birth certificate on Twitter, many people have said that this was the real catalyst that drove Trump to run. This man is quite the narcissist, so he doesn't take public humiliation lightly. Ebert. Yeah, you don't publicly insult a guy like that and not expect him to even the score. He's operating out of what Nietzsche called the master morality of the Roman ethos because such an individual has the power to repay an offense with a corresponding offense. That's the master morality. Such an individual never forgets an offense, and you can be sure that he'll eventually repay it in kind. Culkin. Exactly. In 2016, after 16 years of George Bush and Barack Obama and the application of these pure neoliberal socioeconomic policies, 
across our social and public spaces, the mass privatization, the war machine in the Middle East, the breakdown of community from technology and opiates, we got Trump. In other words, we got what we deserved. One of the tragic things about Trump being elected is that it was such a drastic misdiagnosis of the underlying problem. <clears throat> the entire white working class that had mobilized into his political base, people from Pennsylvania, Texas, Ohio, these are the places that have been most devastated by people like Donald Trump. 25 years ago in these towns, everyone would go on Friday night to watch the football game. There was a sense of community, solidarity that was part of these towns back then. Read the great study of high school football in Texas, Friday Night Lights. What a great book. Someone like Donald Trump undermines that sense of local community and instead brings in this networked techno-narcissism into the forefront. I mean, let's not overly idealize this communal experience, but it was once minimally there, and so much of America it really was, at least far more than it is today. And what has happened over the past 30 years since the rise of network technologies and neoliberal capitalism being applied to the social terrain, or biological terrain, this sense of community has been totally fragmented. Just the possibility of leading a decent, simple life as a working-class Joe in small-town America has tragically been foreclosed. Donald Trump massively misdiagnosed the problem, but he spoke directly to these people's sense of loss, these people's sense of nostalgia. And this is the President of the United States right now. This is the prototypical leader of the free world. So this is where we are presently, and quite frankly, it's somewhat disturbing. Ebert, in your book on Trump, you talk about him being this contradiction, pretending that he represents the Rust Belt retrieval of the working class hero, which is a total contradiction with what he is in essence as a reality TV star. Culkin. Yes, what I say in that book is that he is the cumulative result of the overall cultural and economic logic that's been applied to planet Earth over the last 30 years, what we can call neoliberal global globalization. The neoliberal part is essentially the application of capitalist logic beyond traditional spaces of production. It's the application of capitalist logic to public spaces, to community, to friendship, to the field of healthcare, etc. Meaning it's the logic of capitalism applied to all the places where it used to be expressly forbidden. It's simply capitalist realism, as Mark Fisher would say. Ebert, Facebook is friendship capitalized, Tinder's romance capitalized, and so on. Culkin, exactly. Facebook is a friendship that can be quantified, monetized, and set in an algorithm to allocate any surplus value whatsoever to increase shareholder valuation of the firm. So that is the neoliberalism piece, capitalist mediation everywhere and anywhere. But this only becomes possible with the rise of a new technological form. Big data, networks, computational logic, etc., it is the technology that facilitates neoliberalism into the social. The globalization part of the equation is how the movement of capital, because it has been linked to these powerful networks and digital technologies, can now instantaneously extend itself across any border, socio-political structure, or wall. It just flows right through these barriers. The power of the nation-state to regulate capitalism becomes progressively impotent, and of course, this is the way markets want it. Digital technology is fundamentally borderless. I can send PayPal to somebody in Japan or Nigeria right now, can't I? So the absurdity of Trump's policy is that he wants neoliberalism absent the globalization. In other words, he wants unregulated capitalism effectively contained behind a concrete wall. He wants neoliberalism under the banner of the stars and stripes alone. But of course you can't do that. That is fundamentally impossible because neoliberal capitalism and globalization go together like hand and glove. Globalization was certainly there prior to the advent of global networks in the 90s. An elementary form of globalization can be seen in the various colonial projects of Europe in the 18th and 19th centuries. That same process is now effectively radicalized as it links up with network technologies. The classic Marxist saying to encapsulate this very point is that with capital, everything that is solid melts into air. This is a fundamentally true statement, and this is exactly what Zygmunt Bauman means as well, with his concept of solid modernity, or what Foucault would call disciplinary societies, morphing into liquid modernity and control societies. Hebert. Deleuze and Guattari and Anti-Oedipus talk about how capitalism is civilization's worst nightmare because it undoes all the codes that control the flows. Civilizations are based on very careful codes that are always in place to regulate flows, no matter what the flows are. Electricity running through a power plant is coded by the grid. The flows of energy, communication, sexuality, traffic, everything is a flow and it all has to be carefully checked and coded as these flows move through sociopolitical space. Deleuze and Guattari say that a society's worst nightmare is what happens if you remove all the codes because all the flows run around uncoded and it ends up in total chaos. Capitalism undoes all the codes, and so now in hypermodernity we have an excess of hyperflows. Too much porn, too many choices in the grocery store, too many sites on the internet, too many pharmacological drugs, etc. Under the conditions of hypermodernity, too much is never enough. Culkin. 
Yes, but it is recoded into a pure technical horizon. The craziness you now see on Twitter every day, for example, let's not forget that is all being stored and organized in the cloud, mined by algorithms for personal data. From a different perspective, from the perspective of Twitter, this is not chaos at all. It's actually pure mathematical logic. So even though today everything seems unhinged, totally decoded, as Deleuze would say, the flows are in fact being recoded by this invisible computational logic. Deleuze and Guattari are very clear that when anything is deterritorialized, it's de facto re-territorialized as well. When anything is decoded, it is automatically recoded. But to your point, you're absolutely right in noticing that this recoding that we get with algorithms and satellite technology and computational logic feels totally decoded. We experience it as chaos. The actual experience of it, even though it is in fact coded more efficiently than ever before in history, it feels chaotic. So yes, Trump is this person who wants human life to abide by pure capitalist logic. He wants neoliberalism, but he wants it within a nationalistic, industrialized frame. Ironic for a guy who loves Twitter so much, no? And of course he wants to make America great again. It's a funny slogan because it taps in so wonderfully to the hysterical nature of contemporary liberal ideology. And when I say hysterical, I mean it in a strict Zizekian Freudian sense, a refusal to be symbolically identified by any kind of social authority. You just say that line now, make America great again, and people go absolutely crazy. It's like you killed their firstborn child or something. Even though I disagree with Trump's point of view and his economic plan for the future of America, you can be somewhat sympathetic to his critique of neoliberal globalization as being disastrous. It is true, I think, we should all want to make America great. That, the again part, is the problem, depending on how you look at it. Either it is referencing how we once put a man on the moon, or how we once had slavery. America's past is not strictly great or inherently bad. It has a bit of both, like anything in life. Um, so to a certain point, you can be sympathetic to this idea of wanting to change things, but Trump's solution, putting up a wall, trying to privilege certain traditional modes of social interactivity that were paramount throughout solid modernity, I mean, this is not a great solution to the problems that are innate to neoliberal globalization. Trump was able to mobilize people based upon his charisma, based upon his effective sound bites and tweets that appeared anti-establishment, and also the fact that he could fund a good campaign. Let's not forget about the practical nature of things. This man didn't even have to fundraise to run for president, and that's a huge advantage. So in a way, Trump speaks to this new type of political figure that is unique to hypermodernity, the billionaire with a Twitter account. And look, now Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks, wants to run for president in 2020, another one of these neo-Roman mega money men. We will see more of this in the future, I can assure you. What's very interesting here is that in the old days, and this goes back to Thomas Jefferson and John Adams up until someone like John F. Kennedy, even Bush won to a point, uh, what you had in America were politicians, proper statesmen, people who were educated at Ivy League schools in political science, philosophy, and history. They had this broad view of how society can work. There were a couple of exceptions to this rule, of course, someone like Andrew Jackson being the most obvious one. And then what you get after that is the rise of the technocrat. Barack Obama is not really a politician, he is a technocrat. Donald Rumsfeld or Dick Cheney or Al Gore aren't really politicians either in the classic sense. These people are technocrats. So from the classic politician, we get the post-war technocrat. And now what is happening is something entirely different. What is following from the technocrat is the celebrity, social media politician. Donald Trump is like the discovered truth of the technocrat, in that the technocrat and the celebrity politician have way more in common with each other than with the classic statesman. The technocrat looks at society through the lens of game theory, through the lens of reducing the human being to a machinic appendage caught in a cybernetic web where everything is reduced to logic and mathematical formulae, so everything is therefore transparent. So what we have now in hypermodernity is that the technocrat finally got their wish to come true. This is the great irony. When the technocrat's dream comes true, as it clearly has in a world that predominantly uses a smartphone and a social media account to communicate, what you get in the political sphere are total clowns and jokers, con men. You know why? Because no decent person, certainly no family man or woman, would ever want to subject themselves and their family to this kind of media transparency. So in this scenario, we get people like Donald Trump and Arnold, Arnold Schwarzenegger and anti Maxine Waters running the show. We get this kind of progressive moral degradation, this ethical blackout of political space. The people who are most willing to subject themselves to this kind of experience now are just people who want naked power. People have no real ethical sense, little historical context, and they are not hesitant in the least at having their whole life exposed to the social media gaze. Instead, they take a perverted enjoyment in it. And of course, like anything, there are exceptions. Decent human beings like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. <laughs> I can't believe he said that. She's a total shithead. Oh my God, she's she's 
the absolute epitome of political vulgarity and narcissism. Decent human beings. Come on, Gogan. Or even someone like Ron Paul. Two people at the complete opposite ends of things seem to be exceptions to this rule. Ebert, we should take a moment to look at these guys through the lens of McLuhan media studies because I like thinking about the connection between the media and the type of president that we get. I think in a way you can say that the first presidents, Washington, and Jefferson, and so forth, get into office through newspapers and literary documents. They're textual presidents. They get into office through the long attention spans of people reading newspapers and pamphlets or listening to four-hour debates, like with the famous Lincoln-Douglas debates in the 1860 election, etc., etc. Then I think of FDR as the first radio president. Radio comes in right after the First World War, about 1920, and then pretty soon Roosevelt is in there for over 12 years, and with his famous fireside chats, he uses the radio to create this sense of intimacy, almost a sense of us Americans being part of a tribe, the sense that we are all together in the same struggle. Radio tribalizes. It is acoustic. It activates the acoustic cavern, and I think he captivated people that way. Then I think of JFK as the first televisual president, the youngest president ever to be elected. An attractive ladies' man, he was able to project a very specific image at the time because the television adds image to sound. Nixon didn't stand a chance against Kennedy once they both appeared side by side on television. Television also creates a very intimate environment, giving you the sense that you were there, that you could participate in the White House through importing its conferences into your living room without having to go there. Once again, it felt like a family, like he was taking care of us. And now I think of Trump as the first social media president. He is the first one to tweet his way into office. With Twitter now, we have a medium that is purely apolitical. Every tweet that he sends is instant, and he is able to get his message out there before anyone else can intercept it. He is on top of it with light speed. He is the first truly hypermodern president, a pure avatar, a mask with no substance, no core whatsoever, just sound bites that are 140 characters long, designed to manipulate people emotionally rather than intellectually. Culkin. I think that is absolutely right, but I think we are missing an important transitional figure, a kind of canary in the coal mine, Ronald Reagan. There is a great scene in the film Back to the Future where Marty, Marty McFly, the main character played by Michael J. Fox, goes back to 1955 and he encounters his scientist friend Doc Brown. As he's trying to convince Doc that he is from the future, Doc replies, So you're from the future, huh? Tell me then, who's the president? And Marty says without batting an eye, Ronald Reagan. And then Doc exclaims, Ronald Reagan? The actor? Get out of here! He can't even believe such a thing is possible. But who could believe such a thing in Eisenhower's America? Imagine going back in time and telling someone in 1997 that Donald Trump would be president in 2018. People would think you were absolutely insane. So Ronald Reagan was this transitional point between someone like JFK and Donald Trump, a pure celebrity president, but without access to digital technologies. I think what we got with George H.W. Bush was this temporary throwback. He is this World War II hero. He has the classic American pedigree, his father was this connected investment banker from an old American family, etc. And then we get this series of technocrats, Clinton and Bush too, and then Obama especially. And then with Trump now, we are officially in the hypermodern era of presidents, announcing actual policy decisions on Twitter. I mean, this guy is announcing North Korean policy on Twitter. He's sparring with Kim Jong-un on Twitter about a possible nuclear war. This man is tweeting about World War III. Liberals like to blame this craziness on Trump personally, but it is form itself that is crazy. No Twitter, no Trump. In other words, there is no possible way Trump is president in a society when everyone reads the morning paper and watches the six o'clock news. Trump emerges when the social brain, to use a term by Bifo Berardi, again cracks open from the hyperstimulation of the techno-capital horizon. Ebert, I like your connection to Reagan as a transitional figure because let's not forget that the 80s was, as far as I'm concerned, the apogee of cinema. The 70s and the 80s, that was when cinema was at its best blockbuster after blockbuster, one great film after the next, and Reagan was part of that. He was the first Hollywood actor to become president, and he is riding this wave of Hollywood at its height. So he was the first cinematic president, in other words. Culkin. And at the same time, even though the conceptual origins of neoliberalism are undoubtedly in the 70s, intellectually gestating at the University of Chicago with economists like Gary Becker and Milton Friedman, the 80s is the decade when it is put into political practice by Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan. This is the decade when the neoliberal when the neoliberal horizon is made into the new norm. And then, in 1995, when the internet comes in, neoliberalism is effectively put on anabolic steroids and it begins to flow through networks. As I've written in my book on the heroin epidemic, capitalism was once contained behind the 9-to-5 shift. It was once contained by the perimeter of the factory and the office building. Once you get the basic impetus of capital integrated with network technologies, the 9-to-5 shift becomes irrelevant. The physical space of the office is basically pointless. People work from home at midnight now. 
Ebert. This is Deleuze's idea about the shift from the disciplinary society to the control society, where the disciplinary society is modular. Everything is confined to specific boxes, like the prison, the factory, the school, etc. But in societies of control, and by societies of control, he really means surveillance societies, the societies of electronics. All that is gone because all those borders that once contained the disciplinary structures are liquefied. You can be in jail at home now with an ankle bracelet. You were always in school. You were always taking classes. You've never done with school. So all these structures are just liquefied and we are stuck with them like this goo that we can't get off of us. No matter where we go, the technological horizon of control is there with us. We're never done with it. Culkin. Right, I mean, all control societies are simply societies that can no longer abide by the disciplinary logic of interlocking social structures that subjugate people in a variety of ways. Control societies don't want to be inhibited to consume or in accessing information in any way, shape, or form. Ebert. They've liquefied the boundaries, yes, right. This is why it's absurd the more you think about it for Trump to try and take ne neoliberalism and deglobalize it and put these formal national boundaries back in like a wall. It's the total opposite of what neoliberalism is under globalization. There is no way to stop it. It is a planetary force now. Culkin. But not only is it absurd, it's like a collective suicide wish because what is going to eventually happen is a gestation of World War III. I mean, how can that not happen when you have an entire global society of networks flows of capital crossing over boundaries every millisecond, you have futures trading, you have this entire electronified social edifice, and now all of a sudden you want to put up a concrete wall? What are you, crazy? This is going to eventually explode in some kind of multinational conflict. But at the same time, and to be fair, the way we were going prior to Trump probably leads to the very same destination, too. Ebert. Wendy Brown wrote this excellent book, Walled States Waning Sovereignties, in which she describes how ethnic walls are going up everywhere, all over the planet. Walls along the Mexican border, walls going up in Rio de Janeiro, walls dividing Israel from Palestine, South Africa, from Zimbabwe. All these ethnic pullbacks that are related to the global wiping out of borders. We say here's the technology to eliminate borders and we have free trade now, free trade agreements everywhere, no tariffs, no taxes. Just trade, decode all the flows and put the planet inside a shell of electromagnetic hypercapitalism. But at the same time there is this sense of threat to ethnicities. They are much tougher than nation states to melt down because they have consanguineous blood relations in these tribal ethnicities. And that creates a very strong ethnic bonding system that is much stronger and more primordial than the nation state. So you can liquefy the nation state with these technologies, but not ethnicities because they are tribal and they are ancient and they have been around forever. So plugging in neoliberalism through globalization fuels all these ethnic conflicts. They actually get worse under the conditions of the liquefaction of borders because people now feel lost without borders. How dare you take my border away from me? So we get the energizing of the alt-right in Europe, especially the identitarian form that's paranoid about Muslim refugees coming in from the Middle East and Islamifying cities across the continent. There are complaints in Vienna that there are now entire neighborhoods that look like streets in Turkey with the Islamic bazaars. Culkin. Yes, and then you get the hypocrisy of these prototypical global philanthropists who are so openly critical of this nationalist surge and this is not to defend in any way, shape, or form the 21st century rise of racism and nationalism as a response to neoliberal globalization. I'm not defending that at all, but at the same time you can't blame these people for having these kinds of primal instincts of wanting a wall or immigration restrictions because they don't know what to do, they don't know what to think. And when you have these public figures like Bill Gates or Bono or whoever degrading the white working class as just being racist, it's really counterproductive, not to mention not entirely honest. And the reason why it's counterproductive is because it displaces the fundamental problems of the system itself onto these contingent cultural and ethnic issues. Those are problems, of course, but I don't think the problem. The fundamental problem today is, what is to be done with human beings under a globalized capitalism that is rapidly becoming automated and linked with AI? We are literally on the verge of something so monumental and existential. Will it be World War III? Will it be a takeover by artificial intelligence, or perhaps something completely unexpected. We are at a breaking point in the historical development of the human race. Ebert, the abyss is looming one way or another, whether it's through global warming and rising sea levels or all the tensions between ethnicities and dying nation states preparing for World War III. The abyss is here either way. Culkin, we should talk about The Truman Show as the archetypal hypermodern film. Ebert, right. Well, The Truman Show is about a man played by Jim Carrey in a 1998 movie directed by Peter Weir with a screenplay written by Andrew Nichol. It is very loosely based on a 1959 novel by Philip K. Dick entitled Time Out of Joint. The film concerns a man named Truman who is living in a world that is actually an artificial one. And unbeknownst to him, he is the star of his own 24-hour reality television show. The film follows his awakening to his strange and surreal predicament. 
First he becomes slightly paranoid as he starts to see cameras everywhere. Then he doesn't trust his neighbors. And then he's not too sure about his wife. He starts to, suspe to suspect she might be an actress of some sort. One day he even sees a studio light that falls from the sky right at his feet. After all these anomalies start piling up, he eventually realizes that everything in this show is about him. He lives in a terrarium, a dome with a fake sky, fake sun, fake moon. He spent his entire life from birth inside this terrarium, and at the end of the film he makes his way out of this dome after realizing that it is all fake. It's a stage. And the director, who is in charge of the show, turns out to be a character played by Ed Harris, who is basically a stand-in for God, or the gods, the technician in charge of Truman's life. In a way, his character reminds me quite a bit of the way uh, the Homeric gods managed the life story of Odysseus. They are very interested, very involved. He needs a storm over here, so they set the winds to blow him this way or that. And the interesting thing about this is that image of him punching his way through the hole in the world, which is an echo of a 19th century woodcut showing a man poking his head out of the world dome to perceive the true structure of the cosmic architecture that is running the play of life on Earth. Culkin. Yes, The Truman Show is the prototypical film, perhaps The Matrix 2, that encapsulates some of the key features of hypermodernity in 21st century life. Frederick Jameson has that famous quote, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. And this is a similar situation for Truman as well, living in his protected bubble. We could easily imagine him saying at the beginning of the film, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of the Truman Show. But it does in fact end, so maybe there is hope for us after all. That film shows us very clearly the basic problem today. The problem is not so much what is, the problem is rather that we cannot imagine something new. And the Ed Harris character is really wonderful in the film. He plays the producer of the show. You can imagine him as the guy pulling the strings of Fox News or MSNBC. He is this figure controlling the horizon, organizing what we are even allowed to think. Ebert, Ted Turner, Rupert Murdoch, Howard Hughes, one of those types of guys. Culkin, exactly. It's not so much what we are allowed to think. We can think whatever we want so long as we don't go past a certain limit. It's more what we are allowed to imagine, what we're allowed to dream of. Such forces prevent us from dreaming. That's the thing with The Truman Show. Yes, his life is encased in a very large studio that functions as a movie set. Yes, it's an unbelievably produced reality TV show. But the deeper meaning, I think for me, and this is where I always see a comparison of The Truman Show with The Matrix, is that it constitutes what we can even imagine to be true. The set is like a vibrational field that suspends what Truman can imagine. It kills his dreams. We should ask this question here when analyzing the film. What is the force, the true force, that starts to poke the hole in Truman's worldview? Yes, it is, of course, true that things start to fall apart. The neighbor starts to look suspicious. The lights fall down. That is all fine and well. But the real thing, the thing that really starts to disturb Truman's view of the world, is love. The whole key to this film is how he still has this deep longing for a woman that he once knew in college who tried to warn him about the situation he was in. And she was immediately taken off the set, and he was told that she moved to Tahiti or Fiji, some island in the Pacific. But he still had this feeling for her that lingered throughout his life. And now he's turning 30 years old and he finds himself still in love with this woman. This all reminds me so much of Alain Badiou's incredible book in praise of love. Badiou is the great thinker of the event. And the event is the moment that suddenly protrudes into our social symbolic reality. It literally transforms our sense of the world. And for Badiou, the event is how we become a proper subject, since by following the event we become truly alive. Whenever I thought of the event in Badiou's terms, I always thought of it in political or religious terms. Moses on Mount Sinai receiving the Decalogue is certainly an event the French Revolution, or the shots fired at Lexington Lexington and Concord constitutes an event. In other words, I never thought of the event on the personal level, but Badiou says that love is also an event. When true love comes into our life, it radically disturbs our symbolic coordinates. It ruptures our sense of who we are, and it creates an eventual crisis, and we have to follow that love all the way, all the way to become some, someone entirely new. This is how I read The Truman Show. Yes, of course, it's about the intrusion of the media and these kinds of puppet masters controlling the world, but it's also a film that bears witness to this incredibly simple idea that love can really and truly change the world. It can change our world, Ebert. Badiou's idea of the event manifesting on the plane of love is basically the equivalent of Peter Sloterdijk's microsphere, what Sloterdijk calls in his first Spheres book, Bubbles, a monosphere dyad. The basic dyadic human relationship is a love relationship. It's first formed in the bonding between the mother and the infant, but later in life it becomes the quest for the beloved, and once that happens, a microsphere forms. And it's the minimal dyadic spherical unit. But the problem with that, it renames everything, all the flows have to be recoded, is that when that bubble pops, you get the micro-onological equivalent of the macro-civilizational collapse. You cut up all the pictures, you send nasty emails, now it's a crisis, it's a collapsed microsphere, and you have to survive and move on. Truman has realized that he is in the microsphere, and that he is missing the other, like Orpheus, where his Eurydice has disappeared, 
into the end of the world behind the electronic ma matrix and he can't find her. Um, he can't get her back to reconstruct his microsphere, even though the bond is still there. Culkin, the Truman Show, and I'm referring here to the television show within the film itself, the defining characteristic of that program, because it's totally staged and artificial, is that it is a space without love, and I think that we live in a world right now where human beings are becoming encased in a sheath of techno-capitalist relations, just like the Truman Show. But love is the very opposite of that. So the message of the Truman Show, the real deep message, is actually very simple. The way out of this situation is through love. And not just a romantic love between two people, it is love in the most radical Christian sense. Love one another as I have loved you. All right, so we'll stop there for that edition of Hypermodernity and the End of the World.